All right. Good afternoon to everybody in the room and online. Uh, we are in the fire investigator track and my name is Jeff Pauley. I'm the chairman of the health and safety committee for the IAAI. And so I'm going to first give an overview of things that we are doing, essentially a, a brief overview of the issue, a brief chat about research and talk about our best practices document. And then we've got uh, two uh, experts here on two of the four research projects. And then last but not least, uh, we're gonna talk about a practical application of that. So let's get started. The biggest problem that we run into in the fire investigation world, which is really in two parts, there's the public, right, easy for me to say apparently, the public fire investigators who are typically at the scene, oftentimes while the fire is still in, in the suppression stage or shortly thereafter. We have the private fire investigators who may be there the same day, although that's not as likely, maybe the next day or a couple of days after, maybe a week and maybe three weeks after. And so we've got a wide range of hazards. But one of the biggest issues that we have to overcome is this question right here. And the rhetorical question that it poses, because the reality is no fire scene is a safe scene. The hazards are different depending on when you are there, and that's the focus of the research. But the answer to this question very simply is no. So what are the hazards that we as fire investigators face? There are the physical hazards, there are the environmental hazards, and, and we're not gonna spend time today going over all of those. There are biological hazards, um, but there are also the toxic hazards. And the toxic hazards are the ones that we need to be protecting ourselves from uh, with effective use of PPE because the others, the others can be mitigated in a number of ways. One of the problems that we have with fire scenes is that if you look at the traditional uh, NIOSH slash NASA hierarchy of controls, we can eliminate to some extent. Substitution we can't do, mitigation we can do to some extent, but there at the, the bottom of the triangle is PPE. And as is reflected in the current version of, of NFPA 921, oftentimes that is our only real choice that we've got. Lots of bad things in the fire scenes. The problem that we've got is that these in the fire environment can mix and turn into other compounds and other problems that are unknown. Uh, the extent of the hazard of them is, is unknown. And, and as you can see with this quote from Dr. Calkins at NIOSH, uh, there are, it just presents a range of problems that are unknown at this point in time and all the more reason for us to be protecting ourselves. So as, as this nice video or that nice picture here, should, we believe that over some period of time, gases and vapors dissipate to a quite reasonable uh, level that's non-hazardous. You're going to hear some more about some research that talk about what that timeline is here in a bit. But the problem is that even if the gases and particulates have totally dissipated, and I would suggest to you that that does not occur, but even if they did, the particulates remain until such time as the fire scene goes away. It's either cleaned up, it's bulldozed over, at some point, it goes away, but the particulates stay there. Love this word. This word needs to be in the vocabulary of every fire investigator. Nanoparticulates, the little teeny five micron, two and a half micron, one micron particles that you cannot see that are in the air at every fire scene. And I would suggest in a 
reasonable area uh, that varies from scene to scene outside of the structure. And we're gonna wait for a second while our technician gets the slides back going because I did not do that. Excellent. So they're minute. You do not see them. Uh, Professor John Simbala at, at Penn State has done some nice uh, research on uh, particulate matter at, that you can see. And according to his work, generally speaking, you can see somewhere down to around 70, 60 microns. The majority of the stuff that we're talking about about is much, much smaller than that. You cannot see it, but that's the same bad stuff that when you inhale it is getting down into the furthest depths of your lungs and then it getting absorbed into the, the, your bloodstream and creating health hazards. One of the reasons that many private fire investigators, especially, but in our profession as a, as a the general rule, think that a cold scene is a safe scene is because they don't see anything. You cannot see these hazards. These hazards are present and they present a health risk to us. And every time you walk in, you're stirring that stuff up. So uh, one of the speakers this morning was talking about partnerships and reaching out to the universities I will tell you that one of the biggest problems with fire investigators is that the research money for the most part goes away when uh, as I refer, affectionately refer to as the big red trucks leave. In your jurisdiction, it may be a different color, but the research money stops. We have been working hard as an organization to affect some change to that. So we are essentially working on behalf of all the individual entities, public and private that are doing fire investigations to get research focused more on the post fire environment. So these are list four that, that we have been involved in. You're gonna hear in much more detail about two of them. Um, but I'm going to briefly explain the others to you. So the first one that we did, uh, literally in London, England, with London South Bank University, they are measuring uh, particulates in respirators that are used one time by fire investigators. I would not want to be the grad student who is sitting under the microscope counting these individual particulates, but I'm thankful that they are doing that. Um, so unfortunately, as, as everyone here knows, our research came to a grinding halt for a year or so, but things are back on track now. So that project was on a hiatus, it's back going, uh, and hopefully in the next, uh, before the end of this year, we'll have some, some work on that. University of Miami wristband product project, you're gonna hear more about that in depth. Underwriters Laboratories. There's a great bunch of folks, the uh, Firefighter uh, Safety Research Institute, they had, I think it was Homeland Security money. They were doing a series of about 30 burns in some of those. And those what these photos are on the left side of this screen. They instrumented them to measure gases and particulates in the post fire and then uh, did some room and contents. You can see the picture here in the top right of the, the four pictures. Uh, did some room and contents burns and then closed them up and left them sit for a number of days so we can start to see. It wasn't to the greatest extent that, that, that we had asked for, but it was a great start. And the nice thing is uh, they are looking to do the second part of that later on. So they've got a two-story building that they're gonna hopefully burn this fall. Um, so we will have debris because one of, the, one of the things that we don't definitively know a lot about yet is we, we, know, we know fire debris has particulate matter. That, I mean, that's a given. We don't know definitively what gases are trapped in that debris and that are then released when you, the fire investigator, us, dig it out. So they're going to partially burn this building, have debris, let it sit, dig it out so that we can see that. So that's really good. And then the North Carolina State University project you're going to hear more about. 
There are some other things in the pipeline uh, that will help further this information and what we know about the post-fire environment over the next couple of years. So up till recently, a year and a half ago, there was essentially no research, um, definitive research on, on the post-fire environment after uh, overhaul was completed. So we're, we're, we're working on that real hard. Anybody who is a fire investigator is familiar with this document, NFPA 921. It's essentially our Bible. There is a safety chapter, chapter 13. It has some good information. The, the, the important thing to know is this is an overview document. It's on a five-year review cycle. A lot of work goes into it. Uh, there is a work group currently addressing this chapter and probably will be doing a complete rewrite, but that's, that's still in the to be determined stage. But uh, this, this it, it's good stuff, but it, it is overview. What we as an, uh, a membership organization representing well over 10,000 fire investigators around the world, we have started uh, our best practices document. We came out with the first one in, in uh, 2018. It was 16 pages. It was a simple word document, but it got the information out. And we had to just draw, there's a lot we wanted to say, but we had to draw a line in the sand because based on a survey that we did, we knew that there was a huge need for putting something out there. So we did the first version, uh, first edition in, in 2018, we came out with the second edition. We went from uh, 16 pages to 41 pages. Um, and it is a uh, much more in-depth document. Uh, I've already got about 10 pages of notes for the third edition. Uh, and so that may be next year, we'll see. Uh, but it has become a much more detailed resource document. So you've got 921 sitting up here that's good overview stuff. And then this, which is really becoming a book, uh, we call it a white paper, but it, it, it probably is stretching that definition at this point. Um, but this gives the detailed stuff. It's industry specific. It is peer reviewed. It is technical reviewed. It's not like, uh, uh, you know, you and I got an idea and we just put it together and, and it worked fine. And, and if nobody likes it, we'll go play golf or whatever. There are a lot of people who play a role in the data that's included, the information that's included. And there's a group of subject matter experts, many of whom Dr. Uh, Burgess, Dr. Kavan, who are here at this, who review it and others, uh, the NIOSH, folks review it uh, specifically in addition to their research folks, the personal, I always get this name wrong, the personal protective technology laboratory, I believe is correct, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. So th there are a lot of people that look at this and it's so it's an, an industry wide document and really pertains to the nuts and bolts of, of what, what you should do. So uh, I'm gonna spend just a couple minutes going over that because it is, it is the best practice uh, for conducting uh, fire scene investigations. So here's just a list of the changes uh, from first edition to second edition. I'm not one to read slides to you. You can read them yourself, but we made a lot of changes. It's, it's, uh, it's a document that, that, that our committee is very proud of. It's divided into two parts with three appendices. And part one is the meat and potatoes of it. And, and you can see how that is broken down. And we're gonna cover uh, just briefly overview of how that is broken down. Uh, Appendix A covers uh, in very great detail respiratory protection guidelines. There are methodologies on the uh, OSHA website and on NIOSH websites to figure out respiratory protection methodologies. The problem is with those online tools is that you have to know what the specific hazard is. We don't know that, right? So 
The smart folks who put this together have come up with a recommendation for what the minimum standard should be. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, so we break this down into all these groups. So from, from an employer perspective, uh, just briefly, written policies are very important. You can see the list of them here. Uh, skin checks, physical examinations are very important because as we know, latency is a big problem. And uh, if you have an acute exposure, you know, you, you fall, you cut your hand, you break your leg, whatever, that, that's one thing. But uh, chronic things take a long time. Uh, Leukemia is three to five years. Lung cancer can be 30 years. Uh, so having all these policies, doing the, these health checks is very good. And obviously, behavioral health, mental health is as big a factor as it is for fire investigators anywhere else in the fire service. Vehicles, very important. We, we uh, certainly support the clean cab concept that, that the fire service uses. Uh, nothing contaminated in the passenger compartment of the vehicle. Um, very important because this is how we are, if we're not protecting ourselves, helping to transmit the problem to other places. So obviously we want individual fire investigators to be healthy and fit and be able to do their job. Uh, and so we address that. Um, written scene exam log. I don't care, at, and, and somebody used a, and I don't recall offhand who it was yesterday, used a great term, a career diary. I love that term because that's what it is. Over the course of your tenure as a fire investigator, you may work at two, three, four, five different jobs. They may be keeping track of your exposures, which is every fire that you went to, but there's no cumulative thing. If you keep a list, University of Miami's personal exposure reporter is an excellent tool online. It can be something as simple as a notebook or an Excel spreadsheet on your computer. It doesn't matter, but you need to be keeping track of these exposures. During the in, uh, incident, it's important you know, to, to be there, be safe, do a 360. You can see two photos here of properly attired uh, fire investigators, uh, public on the upper left, private on the, the, uh, the lower right in this particular picture, but regardless, they are wearing the PPE that they should be, and that's important. It's important for you to, to be, have the tools for PPE available for you. Um, taking breaks is good. Cleaning yourself when you take a break is good. Uh, the number of pe people who, they may be wearing gloves. I, I hate to say that I've seen this, but they use their mouth to pull their gloves off. Okay, that is that is not good, right? Properly doffing your PPE, cleaning yourself before you eat, all this is good stuff. After why, afterwards, there's a proper way to do decon and to doff your equipment. Our document covers it in great detail. It's slightly different for public and private fire investigators, but at the end of the day, there's a process that needs to be followed in order to ensure that you are properly cleaned and deconned and obviously the shower as soon as possible. Now, you know, on the public fire side, the phrase is shower within an hour. Well, that's great. Unfortunately, on the private side of what we do, the fire investigator may have a two hour drive home, may have a three hour drive home. So it's still important as soon as you get there to clean yourself. Training is important. This, this is an area that, that is, is well addressed in some areas and very poorly addressed. So we, we cover specific best practices, procedures for fire investigator training. The number of fire investigators who are given a first aid kit, but provided no training whatsoever in basic first responder first aid is very surprising to me, which is why we've got it covered here. We, we need to be doing that. So to close this out, I promised you there's a minimum respiratory protection guideline within our best practices. This is it. There's pictures of it on the left. Um, it's two part, it is filter and cartridge, anything less than a P100 cartridge is worthless in what we do. It has to be P100. P does not start, stand for particulate. It stands for oil proof. Um, 
There are some other exceptions. If you are wearing the half piece, uh, you need to be wearing goggles to protect your eyeballs from ocular absorption. But this is the minimum respiratory protection. You can go up from this. You can have PAPRs, you can have SCBA. There are many agencies that are, are doing SCBA through their entire fire investigation. That's wonderful. But at the very minimum, this is it. So that's the end of this nice overview. My contact information here, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, if you have anything that you want in the second best practice or the third rather edition, let us know. Um, next up, we have, oh, oh, we have a question online. Cool. All right. Sorry. I, <laughs> Yes. A little soft spoken. Um, this question is from Michael Hill. He wants to know, are there any studies to look at the risk of forensic laboratory workers who are testing samples or for laboratory exams done by engineers and fire investigators weeks and months after the fire debris is collected and shifted into the lab? That's a good, that, that's, that's a, that's a good question. So there, there's a, a two parts. So read me the they don't need to hear again, but read me the second part or the first part again. Um, Just, are there any studies to look at the risk of forensic laboratory workers who are testing samples? Right. Okay. I, I'm not aware of any. That does not mean that in, in any of my other experts here, I'm seeing nothing, nothing. Pro so probably, probably no. Um, but that's not a definitive answer. The second answer, or the second part of that question, though, is very important and very interesting. And I, I don't have it in this slide deck, but I will, I'll tell you just a real quick story. Um, a scientific lab that collected uh, totes of fire debris, and they take it back to their lab, and they are going to sift through the debris which is pretty much on point with what, what this guy's asking about, right? Anytime you disturb the fire debris, you're getting particulates, the, the nanos, love that word, the little stuff that you can't see. These guys are sitting there with no gloves, no respiratory protection, sifting through this debris. Bad, 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 bad practice. So anytime that you, the short answer to the question is that anytime you're exposing yourself to fire debris, there's going to be particulate matters. Gases we don't know about, maybe, maybe not, but the particulates there, that stuff's really bad for you and best practices applies. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right. So next up is Umar, and I'm going to let you just introduce yourself. That's easiest. Yeah. Okay. All righty. So uh, good afternoon, everybody uh, in the room and on Zoom. Uh, my name is Umar Bakali. I'm a graduate research assistant, a doctoral student at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Miami. And I've been with the Sylvester Firefighter Cancer Initiative, the Environmental Sampling Program, since uh, 2017. So dating back into my undergraduate years. And what I have to share with you guys today is a bit of research on silicone samplers for assessing exposure in arson investigators. So I'm going to divvy this up into two parts. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go over the, the how and what of our exposure monitoring. So how exactly we measure in not just fire investigators, but firefighters in general. And then I'll go over what we found when we distributed wristbands to fire investigators in North Carolina. So carcinogenic exposure in the fire environment, in the fire response environment is diverse. It goes through a lot of different compounds. For example, we have the B-text compounds, benzenes, toluenes, and xylenes. Uh, you'll find them in uh, situations where you have uh, industrial solvents that are burning, in situations that you may have uh, petroleum that's burning, and also in uh, the same places where you'll find uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which is mainly the subject of my talk today. 
uh, you'll find halogenated aromatics and hydrocarbons in fire situations in which uh, you have flame retardants that are burning, for example, polybrominated, sorry, polybrominated diphenyl ethers that uh, you find as flame retardants and furnishings. There's a bit of inadvertent self-exposure that I'm sure you've heard in the talks earlier today through uh, PFAS, which also are halogenated air, uh, hydrocarbons uh, that are present in aqueous film forming foams. And you'll also find polychlorinated chlorinated biphenyls or PCBs in plasticizers and uh, sometimes even uh, transformer fluids from electronics that were manufactured in the 60s and 70s. You'll find phthalates in plastics and, of course, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are the subject of my talk today. Oops, let's go back one. So PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or polyaromatic hydrocarbons, is a term that we've heard already ad nauseum for the last uh, 48 hours or so, um, and possibly more. They're, uh, an I, they're classified in general as IR group, group 2B carcinogens, and they're produced during the process of incomplete combustion. So that is the case in any situation where you have a fuel rich and oxygen poor environment, and that fuel usually contains carbon. So whether it's a car fire, whether it's a building fire or a residential fire, you're likely going to find these there. And what's important to note about PAHs is the fact that they give us a good model of acting like particles or like vapor. So they give us a way to identify how firefighters and fire investigators are exposed in both ways. So the, the birth of a PAH starts from your fuel. And when your oxidizer starts to run low, you have pyrolytic reactions. There's no more oxygen to react with. So these compounds will start cracking and turning into aromatic compounds that become very thermally stable and they start to become hydrophobic and they start to coalesce, they stick together. And eventually that's what causes these uh, particulate matter to form. So the PM 2.5, PM 10 sorts of particulates that you can barely see, not at all, that sticks to your gear, sticks to your SCBA, sticks to basically everything as long as you're trudging around in it. And when these pHs are metabolized, they're internalized, they can cause lots of problems. Specifically, um, and I'm going to use benzoapyrene as the example, uh, benzoapyrene among pHs is classified by IARC as a group one carcinogen. So it is known to cause cancer with all certainty. Uh, the body has a xenobiotic metabolism. And what this allows us to do, or as humans and in other animals as well, is to take foreign molecules that were introduced to us uh, either through ingestion or inhalation and modify them so that they can be moved out of the body. And that sounds all well and good. The problem is, is that these particles, once they're metabolized, they can become very reactive. And in this case, they can react with DNA. And of course, when you have any sort of molecule that can interact with DNA and change its shape, change its structure, you have the potential for cancer. But that's not all that these metabolites can do. They can also induce P53 mutants, um, which is relevant to cancer. P53 is a gene that, uh, or is a protein rather, TP53 is a gene, I believe, um, that is known as the guardian angel of the genome. It prevents cells from replicating if they don't pass certain checkpoints. Um, you can uh, disrupt apoptotic pathways, which basically allow for cancer cells to basically commit suicide before they replicate too far along. And of course, they can also result in inflammation, which is associated with any number of potential uh, comorbidities along with cancer. For example, infl inflammatory bowel disease, a product of inflammation. So as Jeff was saying earlier, um, these compounds, they can travel everywhere. We have a contamination exposure cycle that details what happens after a fire personnel has been exposed in a fire situation. So after exposure in a fire situation, it can get onto their turnout gear. If they're not careful, if they bring the turnout gear into the passenger 
a room inside the vehicle, it can contaminate the fire engine. They can bring these back into the fire station. Sometimes firefighters or fire investigators may carry it inside their personal vehicle, which is a big no-no because anybody else who rides in there may also be exposed. And potentially from there, even they can bring it back into their personal, into their homes, and that will affect their family and friends. So the meat and potatoes of how exactly we measure uh, fire investigators and firefighters in general, their exposure is through the use of silicone wristbands. And silicone wristbands are very robust, very inexpensive, and they're able to act as sponges in a way that uh, allows us to absorb the compounds in the air, have them stick to the wristbands and give us a way to give us a sample of, their ex of uh, fire personnel's exposure. We've used them in a variety of contexts. Um, we've used them in, for example, just in fire stations. We've left them around the common areas just to see uh, what is the background level of contamination. And you can see here, uh, that's just soot from, I think, a garage and a fire station. Uh, we've had them distributed to firefighters who are both on duty in the station and on duty in the actual fire situation. We've even actually placed these silicone wristbands inside Pelican in cases filled with used firefighter gear to see what sort of off-gassing is coming out from them. And we published these findings in September of 2020 in, uh, in uh, the Journal of Ecotoxicology and Environmental Safety. And that's not all we've done with wristbands. We've also deployed them in environmental contexts as well. So in the aftermath of Hurricane Michael in October and November of 2018, we went up to Mexico Beach, which is in the Florida Panhandle, and we've linked up with firefighters in that area. So that's me. Um, I know I don't have the beard then, but <laughs> with the fire chief in the area, and we distributed wristbands there. Um, we've also distributed wristbands in controlled life fire trainings to see how carcinogens can move away from an active fire situation and into what firefighters will call the warm zone and the cold zone. And we've also checked in a, a flashover simulator sort of training as well. And believe me, those were very heavily exposed wristbands. So to give an idea of how exactly our silicone samplers work, you can see on the micro scale, uh, so this is a 20 micrometer resolution, silicone is porous and it's these pores that allow for the molecules to deposit inside them. So they really are like sponges. And prior to us distributing it, we make sure that they're solvent cleaned and then vacuum ovened to make sure that there's no solvent remaining before a firefighter or fire investigator wears this but it also makes sure that there's no contamination present either that would interfere with our analyses. So the overview of how exactly we get the data from an exposed silicone wristband is essentially it comes down to exposure, handing it in, extraction, and then analysis. So after it's been handed in, we go through an extraction process what we like to use is pressurized liquid extraction. And to put it simply, it's much like an espresso machine. You place um, the silicone or soil or water or textile or any other sort of matrices inside an extraction cell. And this uses hot solvent uh, at a very high pressure. So like an espresso machine, water at a very high pressure. In our case, it's ethyl acetate or dichloromethane or some similar solvent and allows us to get very concentrated extract from the, from the silicone wristband. After that, we pre-concentrate. So we evaporate everything down to get it ready for GCMS analysis, filtering if necessary. And GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, to put it simply, is just an obstacle course for the compounds inside each sample. So what this allows us to do is one by one, separate each compound that was inside the sample and have it go through a mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer blasts it with electrons and this causes the, the compounds to fragment in the same way every single time. And if you have these fragments, what you have is essentially a fingerprint of that compound. And each compound also takes a certain amount of time to come out of the gas chromatograph. So the combination between that fingerprint and the time that it came out 
cloud allows us to identify with great uncertainty what compound we're looking at. In our case, we were looking for the 16 EPA priority PAHs. So here comes the second part in which we evaluated their exposure, arson, evaluated the exposure of arson investigators to EPA priority PAHs in North Carolina. So we had a total of 16 fire investigators participate and they gave us 27 wristbands that were each in, each corresponding to an individual fire investigation in Denton, it was individual post-fire investigation. The average investigation duration was about three hours with a minimum of 19 minutes and a maximum of 14 hours. So there was a pretty wide variability, but overall it tended to cluster around the three hour mark. The time of investigation, there tended to be um, clusters at investigations within the day of the fire investigation, and then about three days afterwards. But on average, the data set that we collected is representative of an average of 6.2 days following the fire event. So here we have a heat map that details all the exposures from each fire investigating wristband that we collected. So each row represents a uh, fire incident or a post-fire investigation. And each, or I'm sorry, each column represents um, a, a, an incident. And each row represents the exposure to one of the EPA priority PAHs. So from top to bottom, starting from naphthalene all the way down to dibenzo AH anthracene, we're going from lighter molecular weight pH down to heavier molecular weight pH. And what we see is that from naphthalene all the way down to about fluorinthine, the exposure is extremely heavy. About 90% of exposure is actually attributable to the lower molecular weight pHs. And to look back on it, it makes perfect sense because these pHs are much more volatile. They stay in the gas phase much more frequently and much more easily than their heavy molecular weight uh, counterparts. The heavy molecular weight counterparts tend to be, uh, the exposure from them tends to be more from particulate matter. So then taking this data table, we were able to apply uh, diagnostic ratios. And these diagnostic ratios have been used in other literature, mostly environmental literature, as a forensic tool for determining the source and type of contamination that a person or environment may have experienced. So for example, fluorinthine to fluorinthine plus pyrene, if you compare the concentrations of each, under 0.4, the ratio represents petrogenic sources. So that means to say that it comes from an oil slick that's off-gassing versus say uh, 0.4 to 0.5, which is more indicative of fossil fuel combustion versus greater than 0.5, which is indicative of class A combustion, grass, wood, coal, and that sort. Um, what we've already seen is when we look at the sum of low molecular weight pHs compared to high molecular weight pHs, we can see that less than one is indicative of low temperature, uh, low temperature uh, reactions. And that I don't need a graph to show you. You've already seen it in the heat map here. That's very indicative of low temperature exposure which is to be expected since arson investigators mostly uh, come in and do their work after a fire has been extinguished or at least most of the fires have been ex extinguished. <clears throat> so here we have a graph in which I plotted these two uh, ratios together in which everything on the y-axis uh, refers to that ratio that I explained earlier in which you have petrogenic below this line, fossil fuel combustion, between these two lines and then grass, wood and coal combustion above this line. And then on this, on the x-axis, this ratio has petrogenic exposure on one side and pyrogenic exposure on the other. And we can see that from the wristbands that were provided to us, the clustering tends to stay mainly around the low temperature petrogenic sort of exposure and above this line saying that's about class A exposure. And this also seems to line up with the fact that 80, and that 77% of the samples that we received were from investigations of residential or multifamily structural fire cases. This is most likely to be class A combustion. 
85% of the samples stay within this area. So there's a good line up there. We also see that 62% of samples indicate low temperature exposure. And fire investigations on average, the wristbands that we received back were uh, indicative of um, or corresponded to a, uh, an analysis of what happened about six, six days after the fire event, which again, lines up with, with low temperature exposure. So in summation, we can see that fire investigators sustain significant pH exposure during their on-site audits. And these audits occur within the day to three days after the event most of the time, but they can go much further than that, up to maybe 40 or 60 days. Lower molecular weight pHs comprise the vast majority of their exposure. And it makes sense since these pHs, like I said, are more volatile at lower temperatures than their heavy molecular weight uh, counterparts. And lastly, our diagnostic ratio comparisons support that most of the exposure is indeed from low temperature off-gassing. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my professors, uh, Dr. Sylvia Downer, my PI, uh, Dr. Sapmadeo, and Dr. Alberto Caban Martinez, who've given me a lot of guidance um, throughout these experiments. And also Dr. Jeremy Baum, who's um, really kind of been the one to like pass the torch over to me as I kind of move on and take control all these projects. I'd also like to thank uh, the Florida firefighters and the state of Florida for their funding and uh, also the fire investigators from North Carolina for their participation in this study. And with that, I'll go ahead and take questions. No? Okay. Well, that makes it simple. I guess so. All right. That was, that was good stuff. Uh, I just can't begin to tell you how exciting it is to start to get some definitive data around the post-fire environment. So next up, we have Dr. Brian Orman from North Carolina State University, who's going to tell us about, yeah, I, I find this stuff exciting, I, a, a project that's just starting to get underway, multi-year good research project on um, some work that he's doing. So without further ado, here's Dr. Orman. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and uh, thank you the, uh, everybody here uh, and online uh, for, for listening in um, and for the opportunity to be here and talk about some of this work. Um, this is something that I think, well, Jeff, we had talked probably 2018, I think is when you first came down. Uh, it, was, it was interesting listening earlier today when talking about you know reaching out to universities and and that kind of thing. And that's exactly how this started. Um, Jeff came down and said, you know, looking into some of the questions that we were or research that we were working on, and says, is there anything you know that we could uh, draw from that? And you know, we started thinking about it and said, you know, this is an area that's just ripe for a, a project to itself. And so what we did was start thinking about what we would do. Um, based off of some of the, the projects that we were already running and, and things that we were learning on structural side of things, on wildland side of things, um, and what we could extend to the fire service uh, or fire investigators. Uh, so uh, like I said, I'm Brian Orman. I'm an assistant professor at uh, NC State University. I'm in the Wilson College of Textiles and have a joint appointment in the Textile Protection and Comfort Center, or like we, we like to call TPAC. Um, and so, um, Really, to, to kind of look at this to start with, this project just uh, just kicked off earlier this year. Uh, it was delayed a little bit with everything going on with COVID, but um, uh, this is funded through FEMA, um, and it is a three-year project, a little over a million dollars. Um, so really, uh, the first time we've been able to put a lot of effort into this uh, on our side of things. Uh, the the project primary was submitted through the Fire Protection Research Foundation at NFPA, and so I'm the technical lead uh, on, on that. Uh, we also have a project technical panel, which there are a couple of people here today and probably some listening online that uh, are part of that panel. And so if there's any any interest or any any other feedback, that we, we want to get as much as possible in our, our project plans and things like that. So uh, since we're just really starting this, I want to just introduce the, the project itself uh, talk about what we're planning to do, where we are kind of to date uh, as we go through. Because like I said, it started technically in October of last year, but we really started working in about January or February. 
Uh, so just a little overview, um, you know, when you kind of think of this story, um, how do we get here? Um, if, you, if you think of fire investigators, um, the, the research regarding investigator health and safety, like we've talked about, has, has lacked. Uh, it's, it's fallen behind, uh, not kept pace with structural or wildland. And that was really what kind of started us to think about this area in terms of doing a full research project dedicated to it is because there's just not as much that you can, you know, you can, you can infer some things, you can translate some of the research, but it's not always going to be just a direct comparison. You're going at different times, different temperatures, and the, the uh, scene is different. And so we wanted to look at this uh, from a couple of phases, but one thinking about it, like Jeff said earlier, there's really no consensus standard, it's like, you know, from the NFPA standpoint of what people should wear. Uh, what you what what the PPE should be, how effective it should be, how should it be tested, all of these different things. Uh, so that was one that we started with. Um, but when you go back, uh, look in what 1996, um, ATF requested a health hazard assessment uh, for fire investigators, specifically about respiratory protection or respiratory hazards. Uh, and so NIOSH did that study and found that um, both formaldehyde and like we just saw, uh, there's a lot of PAHs that are present. And so they recommended a wearing appropriate respiratory protection uh, and increasing ventilation, right? So that's your, your kind of first step there. Then we moved to 2007. And so they had a couple other questions and they requested NIOSH to evaluate this ability uh, to kind of transfer contaminants um, during laundering. And so what they found there with that study was uh, due to the potential for the exposures uh, to these carcinogenic pHs and other things, they suggested wearing protective clothing. Didn't really say what you should wear, but just said, you know, you should wear something. Um, and then to reduce the possibility of this transfer to your personal vehicle, to home, things like that during laundering, um, you can use a disposable uh, PPE system or carry out professional uh, laundry services. So there's respiratory hazards, you need to wear PPE. Uh, maybe we should use disposables or laundry things. Um, then you go and you look at when some of the studies where people have actually worn uh, are done to look to see how effective some PPE is. Uh, and this is one of the cases where you have to go to a different kind of branch here with structural. When you look at structural firefighting, there's been a couple of studies, one in Queensland, Australia, one by Kenny Fent and, and his workers, um, saying that even, even when you are wearing protective clothing, things still get through, right? So the, the structural gear itself is not intended to block vapors. Uh, a lot of these are in the vapor form. There's things in particulate form. You're just now starting to get things come out. Uh, with particulate blocking layers and things like that. So you have this kind of culmination of we need to wear PPE, but there's not really any designation of what that should be, how effective it should be. And so what does this mean for fire investigators? What can we draw from this? When you look at it, the average uh, structural firefighter, we did a, a survey a little while back. They said they went interior on a fire two to 10 times a year. Now that's highly dependent on your, your specific location, how busy your station is, all that kind of stuff. Well, if we just take that as a starting point, when you look at investigators, I think it was the IAI study uh, or a survey where 80% of investigators reported one to seven investigations per month. You extrapolate that out, you're getting up, up, upwards of 84 per year. Then you think about uh, the 8% there that said they went to more than 12 per month. You're, you're, you're really increasing the number of op or the opportunities for exposure. Then the, just like we saw earlier, the average duration of staying is much longer than with structural, right? So 30 minutes, two hours, I think uh, it was about three hours with yours, uh, upwards to 14 hours. So what this all equates to is more exposures, longer durations, and probably less protected than they should be. And so all of this comes together to just really cry for this need uh, for this research that we're hoping to do. So what's the purpose? The purpose of this is to uh, really study, or this study is to, to improve the health and safety of fire investigators by doing two things. One is looking at the gear. How effective is it at blocking vapors? How effective is it at blocking particles? How effective is it at allowing you to feel uh, the heat, or not necessarily feel the heat, but release heat through there? How comfortable is it? Um, and then confirming that these on-scene decon or uh, pl uh, preliminary exposure reduction strategies, how effective are they? Things like wipes. Um, there are one of the issues I've been dealing with since, I don't know, 2015, 2016. There are no standard methods for evaluating if wipes are effective. There's data out there that manufacturers have put together uh, best they can. But a lot of times when you see those, they, the data is 
suspect uh, in some cases, the, the methods that were used, the substrates that were used. Um, you know, if you put a piece of, uh, or you put a drop of water or something or a chemical on a surface, you let it sit for a, for a minute and you wipe it up. That's not really representative of what happens when your skin comes in contact with vapors or particulates. And so part of this, uh, we're able to build this in to really look at wipes. And the reason we're, we focus uh, heavily on wipes here is because that's something that will be available to most investigators. You know, like, like Jeff said, when the big red engine leaves, you may not have um, water there. You may not have a source to do kind of the, the more detailed uh, exposure reduction strategies. Uh, so we're looking at wipes, but then also some other, some other opportunities uh, to see how effective they are, building off of what's been done in the other sides. Some of our objectives, um, like I said, we're gonna evaluate a set of, of suits, set of ensembles uh, for vapor protection, um, for particulate protection, and for thermal burden. And then take all that and try to incorporate and try to come up with specifications, performance standards, all that kind of stuff that we can put into NFPA 9, uh, 921, at least as suggestions. And say, this is, if you wanna have a, uh, something similar to kind of the 1971 standard where it says everything you need to know about the structural gear, you know, we wanna be able to do that and say, this is what you need. Um, <clears throat> on the second kind of half of the project, the re exposure reduction strategies, uh, things that we are doing here is working with our vet school. Uh, so the College of Veterinary Medicine at NC State is a um, really um, uh, world uh, kind of renowned uh, group looking at dermal absorption, looking at how this, this chemicals actually get into the body, uh, not just animals, but we use animal models to predict for people. Uh, so doing some dermal absorption studies on the PAHs that we've looked at um, and then establishing this, this realistic and repeatable measure uh, or, or way of contaminating skin, contaminating fabric, not just uh, what you'll see a lot if you look at uh, current methods for um, cleaning and things like that. Uh, it, we even do it ourselves with some of our projects. It's taking a chemical mixture and just spiking it on a surface in a liquid form. You know, how representative is that of somebody going into a building where you have vapors and you have particulates? How representative and how can we do this? Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit. Um, and then making this standardized systematic approach for, you know, can we make just a quick, easy, simple test method that any manufacturer could take a wipe, use it and say, okay, it, it meets this requirement, something like that. The last part of this is bringing this all out of the lab, putting it into the field, right? So it doesn't really do us any good or anybody any good if we don't know if what we're doing is relevant, right? So we can make test methods in the lab that are very repeatable, uh, very controlled, but if they're not telling us what you actually experience when you're out there, then it doesn't really help. And so what we wanna do is take all the tests that we do, all the suits that we, we were looking at and working with our state fire marshal's office, go out to actual uh, fire investigator training burns and be able to use these things and see how our data compares. Some of the outcomes I've already mentioned, being able to provide input, um, to the 921 committee, try to update the standard there, um, identifying how effective some of these procedures are uh, for uh, exposure reduction for fire investigators particularly, and then recommending these procedures, whether it's through the NFPA, whether it's independent service providers that may be cleaning gear, whatever it is, we wanna be able to get that information out. And so this is just, just to, I know it's a little difficult to see, but just to show you the breakdown of the project that I've kind of gone through, we have these two main phases and two main tracks looking at the gear itself, looking at the exposure reduction, and then bringing it all together into the field. So just to give you a little bit of information, uh, the reason we wanted to look at the vapor protection, um, you know, we, we think about structural turnout suits, things like that, um, they're not intended to, to block vapors. Um, you know, I, I got into this uh, early on from the hazmat side of things. Uh, so at NC State, we have, this is our man and simulant test facility. Um, and so the man and simulant test is used in NFPA 1991, 1994 to certify hazmat suits. We basically fill that chamber with a chemical vapor. It's methyl salicylate, uh, smells like mint. Um, and that's a simulant for mustard gas. And essentially we pad, uh, we use these little pads or passive adsorbent dosimeters. I didn't know that was even an acronym to begin with, uh, but they're, they're pads. We put them all across the body, uh, very similar to the silicone bands that you just heard about. These are just kind of little patches that have a powder in there, it's sorbent powder. Um, and the, the film that's over top of those mimics the uptake rate of the forearm uh, of a person. And so what we do normally with that test 
is we put somebody in a hazmat suit, we put them in there and we're able to see the leak points in that suit to that vapor. Uh, so the thought here is if we can do it here, one of the things we wanna do is there's nothing stopping me really from taking this out of this lab and putting it into an actual building. You know, whether that is structural firefighters or if it is uh, in this case, investigators and trying to understand instead of you know, what's really been done so far with the limitations that we've had are, are kind of one point measurements. Um, with this test, we have 30 samplers and it's going to actually move into 36 samplers across the body. So we can get a more detailed understanding of where things are coming in. And so uh, we may, you know, we may change the durations. This test is either 30 minutes if you're doing a structural suit or, or a uh, hazmat suit, or it's two hours for military. So we might look at altering the time to better fit fire investigators. Uh, maybe look at a couple different movements because really they're just doing kind of stretches and uh, crawling in place, climbing up a ladder. Essentially in this test, if there is a leakage, you want to be able to see it. And that's what's going on here. So when we think about this, um, one of the things we obviously have to do is think about what fire investigators wear currently. Um, and it's all across the board. Um, if you go out and look, and, and I think the, the best practices white paper has done a good job of putting all of that together and say, okay, here's, and it's not to say that everybody needs to wear the same thing. There are going to be different times where you show up at a different scene. You know, obviously you don't want to wear, um, you know, a disposable Tyvek if you need to run in and the structure is still, uh, you know, kind of involved. Um, so you may get people with in, in full turnout. And so, um, you know, we're looking at things from the, the lowest end, uh, you know, a short sleeve shirt and, or a long sleeve shirt and a pair of pants uh, that, that some people wear. The disposable options of different Tyvek suits. Uh, so those, the biggest differences between these are how the seams are sealed. Um, so you may have some that have actually um, uh, closed seams, essentially, as opposed to, you know, this is the, the 400 version, which is intended for, you know, kind of different uses, but maybe what most people use. Um, and then you have two-piece garments, you have a coverall. Uh, the reason to look at a coverall versus a two-piece is you, you get rid of one of the interfaces around the waist. You get rid of one of those places where things can come in, which also happens to be near the groin, uh, one of the more sensitive regions of the body for absorption. Um, and then you move up to, you know, the structural turnouts. And even, you know, one option here is, is the particulate protective structural suits uh, that we, we actually work to develop one of those and, and kind of using this full range to understand how they would work. Um, and so in, in going forward with this, we're actually picking these out right now. So if anybody has any comments or anything like that, we'll be glad to take those and try to, to, to figure out exactly which ones we want to use, because these also are just the garments. They're not everything else that goes along with it. So just like Jeff said, if you use a, a, um, Half, uh, half face, we have to have goggles, or you know, do we need helmets, do we need gloves, boots, what should we use to keep consistent across this? So after we uh, get, uh, pick those out and we're looking at the vapor protection, um, the other thing is to look at the fluorescence, uh, some sort of fluorescence test for particulates. Um, many of you have probably already seen the, uh, the, the fluorescent images that came out 2015, 2016 with structural suits. Um, this, this test, um, you can see it's kind of hard to see the person. That's about 170 milligram per cubic meter um, concentration of particles there. And this is a way that they do, do uh, structural suits. If you go to the hazmat side, there's a standard that has a, a reduced concentration. This is not necessarily what you would see in a fire investigation. Everything's kind of settled down uh, for the most part. And so we need to look and see how should that test be done. There's also only one place that does this test. And so we've looked into potentially working with them. Uh, the problem with it is it's incredibly cost prohibitive. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to get some of these, this testing done. So what we've looked at is some different options. Um, and, and essentially thinking of it as an investigation scene, uh, for lack of a better word, can we construct almost a sandbox type thing where you would have some sort of simulant debris that we put in there and have it coated with some of the fluorescent powder. Go in, you do something, some of the exercises, you know, squatting down, digging through and see what comes out. Uh, using our mist facility as an environmental chamber to control the temperature, the humidity, the wind speed, all that kind of stuff. So we're actively looking into how we would go about doing that. And the way you measure that um, is that you have quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative being one of the things we want to do, and we'll talk about this in a moment, is taking our passive vapor samplers, but also coupling those with a skin surrogate that we have um, to be kind of a passive particulate sampler. Can we use that instead of the way the test is done normally is you either only take visual pictures under black light or you go through and you actually have 
have um, skin wash samples. So they'll take a little little circle and they'll wash it out with a liquid and collect the fluorescent particles. But we want to got, try to try to do both of those. Uh, the reason, you know, the qualitative data speaks volumes. You know, you can show people numbers and, and data all day, but you show a picture of everything to, you know, just kind of distributed across the body where it's building up and it really makes an impact, especially with firefighters. I think that's what happened. That's why we started paying attention originally with uh, particulates um, is because those, those original pictures came out of this test and really caught people's attention. Anytime we're dealing with protection, whether it's vapor, particulate, whatever it is, we always ask the question of how does it impact the comfort? How does it impact the usability? Um, because you can protect someone to the point that they can't do a job. And so all, this also depends on where you are in the country, right? So if you're going out as a fire investigator, up north, it may be cold versus if you're in Arizona, it's going to be hot. And so, you know, some of those suits do not let air go through very well, do not let heat escape. And so what we want to do is understand the balance there. And so uh, as you build up layers, you see something like the, uh, this is on our thermal sweating mannequin that we have. It's a standardized approach uh, that uh, the, the turnout composites are actually tested on a sweating hot plate to give us a total heat loss value. Uh, we also have the mannequin that we can do this with. Essentially what happens is you heat this mannequin to skin temperature and you monitor the power it takes to keep it there. So if it is a really insulative garment, you don't have to put a lot of power in. Uh, if it's really a, a garment that allows a lot of heat to move through, you have to constantly heat the, the, the body to skin temperature. Um, so that's, that's that first phase, really evaluating all those ensembles and trying to figure out how they actually work, how they're, where the balance falls in terms of their performance and their comfort. And then we move over to our kind of dermal exposure type um, part of the project. And so just like you already heard, um, looking at what chemicals to pick, we know PAHs are, are those incomplete combustion products, they're going to be there. And so when we look at them, you know, we have ones in the class that are definitely group one, the benzoapyrene. And then we have things, uh, naphthalene, I believe is a 2A and we have, or 2B. And we have other ones that are um, not uh, classifiable at the moment. We also wanna look at them in terms of other properties. A lot of times when people pick chemicals for a test battery, they just randomly kind of pick things. And we wanna make sure we have kind of bookends. We wanna cover a full spectrum. And so when we think about that, you have naphthalene at one end uh, and you have some of the larger ones at the other end. You can see the boiling points increase. So things just like we saw earlier, naphthalene and phenanthrene are gonna be more in the vapor phase. Uh, some of these larger ones are gonna be in more of the particulate side. So trying to capture both of those. Um, and what we're doing with that, you can kind of see, um, so this is some preliminary data that we've gotten. Uh, one of my graduate students uh, was working with our vet school, looking at skin absorption. Um, and, and we're using pig skin as a model to start with. Um, but uh, pig skin is, uh, or porcine skin is, is a better analog than some things. Uh, you'll see a lot of dermal absorption studies that use mice or rats. Uh, their skin is a little bit different and, and you get, and typically you get faster or more absorption through those. Um, think of human skin and pig skin are, are kind of like a brick wall where you have in, individual cells are offset. And so you have to travel around them. Uh, mice and rat skin is typically kind of vertically oriented. Things can go through a little easier. Um, and so, but they're, they're still decent models, but you can always be, have better. Um, <clears throat> but we found this, um, we really started looking at this because we needed something that we could use in our standardized test. Um, we can't use pig skin, live animal tissues in a, in a test say for wipes and things like that. And so we wanted to have something that was readily available that, that had the properties of skin. So this is actually used, it's called a Sendaver tissue plate. It's actually used for kind of uh, medical training. Uh, this company also makes fully synthetic cadavers uh, for autopsy training med and medical practices and things. And so this skin has a um, it's, or the scarret, surrogate has uh, a lot of the same properties, the, the, the force, the tension, um, the compressibility of skin. And so there's some preliminary data that we, we actually ran because we wanted to see with, with one PAH or, or naphthalene is the one we used, how does this compare to pig skin? Um, so we ran it and we get a very similar curve over time. So this is going from zero uh, minutes up to, I think we did 12 hours. Um, it's just offset a little bit. So we can account for that though. And so the way we did that and the way we continue um, to, or, or planning to do more is to, to these flow through diffusion cells uh, where you, you actually put the, the skin membrane here. Uh, you have a collection media that flows through to simulate kind of blood flow. Um, and then you put your, your compound, whatever it is you're looking at, 
Uh, in this case, we use naphthalene. We put it in an artificial sweat solution um, and you can monitor how much comes through over time. And so we wanna replicate that again with naphthalene, but we're also gonna use benzoapyrene. Uh, that is what's supposed to happen next week, but uh, you actually have to use carbon 14 labeled compounds for this, um, which are very, a little more difficult to order and a, a lot more expensive. Um, uh, because what happens is you just count uh, the isotopes that are, they're not supposed to be there. So they're a lot easier to detect. Um, and so you detect what's in there. Um, and we're also gonna compare back to methyl salicylate since that's the chemical we're using in our, our vapor testing. One of the things that I wanted to do as part of this, many, many people um, uh, on, online, many people in this community have seen this uh, statistic out there that uh, five degree increase in temperature results in a 400% increase in absorption. Uh, it has taken me a long time to track that down. And what we found out was whoever said it first has backed away from it. Um, but that got put in a lot of places. And so what we wanna do and what we'll hopefully be able to do is put some data to that, um, at least with one chemical. Um, I don't disagree with this necessarily. Uh, we don't know that the numbers are right. We do know when you increase temperature, you will increase the, the absorption into skin. I don't know if it's 400, 100% and five degrees, but that's what we're hoping to, to put some data to. Um, the contamination method, I mentioned this earlier, looking at particulates, looking at liquids, how can we do this more effectively? Um, and the more, uh, the more we look at kind of preliminary exposure reduction, on scene removal, things like that, you know, really, we really need to focus and try to figure out a way of, of putting the particulates on the skin uh, or on the surface of whatever it is we're working with. Um, and, and that's one of the things we're hoping to look at. There's a couple of different options. When we, when we look at laboratory tests, a lot of time we, we go back and forth, uh, these competing values of being repeatable versus being realistic. And so many of our tests we do in the lab are very repeatable. That doesn't mean they replicate what you're gonna see on the fire ground. However, one of the things that people try to do a lot and we've done quite a bit is to go to live burns, put fabrics, put materials in there, have them pick up uh, soot or whatever it is. That's, really realistic, not very repeatable. Fire burns differently every time. Samples right beside each other are gonna look very different sometimes. So we can do that, but then the other option is it, we've started looking into some work that the DOD did on uh, exposures for, um, or particulate uh, measurements for uh, explosives. Uh, so they've been actually using inkjet printers to put on particulates in a very consistent repeatable pattern. And so we're looking into that to see if that's something that we can also do. Um, College of Textiles, uh, we actually print quite a bit of fabric um, and you're able to do, you know, potentially put different things in there and print those on. Um, and then we get to this development of this method. And so one of the things we just purchased, it's on the way here anyway, is a, uh, this is actually used for some washability testing and some other ASTM standard. Uh, but essentially we'll be able to put our skin materials in here, put our wipes here, and it's gonna go back and forth in a very repeatable manner, uh, very uh, controlled manner. Uh, and you can put different weights to increase or decrease the PSI that you would be pushing down. Everybody's gonna use a wipe at a different kind of force. Um, so we're gonna be using that. The other thing we can do is flip this over, not use wipes um, and, and use a contaminated fabric and put our uh, brushes and look at the exposure reduction. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to do both of those here. Um, and finally give us a, a standardized approach to be able to evaluate. Once we have those, then when we get to the, the, the big part of this of looking at the wipes. So being able to compare a dry wipe, uh, soap and water, you know, a generic baby wipe versus uh, we've got partnerships with at least two of the uh, commercial skin decon wipe companies. Um, and trying to understand, you know, some of the tests, like I said, some of the tests that are out there, you know, they'll give you their results, but then you look and see they've tested other things. And the way things are tested, you could probably, pass with a paper towel, um, a dry paper towel potentially. And so we want to look at that and try to understand how the method should be designed so that we can actually discriminate between things that work and things that don't. The other thing that uh, we want to make sure is, are there chemicals that shouldn't be in there? Uh, there are certain chemicals that people use in decon or in uh, cleaning solutions and things um, that are going to be, you know, can potentially exacerbate dermal absorption. Um, or uh, one, of the, one of the companies actually mentioned to me, I was talking with a, a firefighter who works with them and was saying that, um, you know, if it's on the engine, we're going to use it for whatever. There are certain chemicals that if there's a dog or a cat and they need to wipe them off, that some of those, some of those compounds that are used are not healthy for animals. Um, and so you have to think about what they're going to be used on, what should or shouldn't be in the, the solution there and go from there. Then the last thing, uh, like I said, work with the North Carolina's um, uh, State uh, Office of the Fire Marshal. 
uh, get these down select to at least four of those first eight suits to be able to take out, pad, pad up the, the individuals and with the samplers that we're gonna use and see how well our data compares. But then also be able to go back, not just look at the wipes, be able to look at the other on-scene um, prim uh, primary exposure reduction strategies. Uh, so whether that is just simple brush, uh, brushing off um, other things that would be available to uh, fire our investigators that may not, uh, they, they, you know, we, maybe the only things they have that they can't do uh, or wouldn't normally do uh, if the, the full structure or uh, unit was there. Um, and so, uh, but with that, um, just to kind of, to finish up there, uh, everybody likes to see fire at the end. So this is what is <laughs> actually our pyro head uh, test system that we use. Um, but um, we're very, very excited that this project was finally awarded um, and, and really excited to get started. Um, we, I, have, I have two grad students that are currently working on this um, and they are, and we're kind of splitting things up, trying to make sure that we're selecting things appropriately. Like I said, if there's any comments, any questions or anybody has any feedback regarding any of the, the suits or any of the decon methods that may be used out there. Um, you know, we know, like Jeff said earlier, even if you stop an investigation to eat, you know, just the fact of, of wiping your hands, washing your hands off, all those types of things. Uh, what can we, is there, is there any other things that we need to look at? Um, this project has another uh, two, a little over two years left um, now that we've, we finally got everything kind of started. So uh, we are, like I said, excited to get it going and I'll be glad to take any, any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, the question being, uh, with, with arson investigators, you typically have a lot of them bring in a accelerant detection canine. Um, and the question of, of whether the fur or the animal itself is going to be a significant vector for, for transferring that, um, this is actually something I've been thinking about quite a bit um, as we started thinking about this. Um, Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that's, there's a couple of things there with the animal, right? So um, not just the, when I first started looking into some of this, I just, or, or thought about the, the, the canines, um, you know, went back and looked at like 9-11, where a lot of the search and rescue dogs uh, died from cancer as well. And I started searching and you find out that quite a few of the uh, accelerant detection canines in different departments. I mean, just searching online, you find news articles where they're, you know, they died from this cancer or that cancer. Uh, so they're clearly being exposed just the same. Now, whether that is through their fur, through the pads of their feet, because they will probably absorb through that if they're not wearing some sort of, of uh, booty or sock or something like that, which I know are, are out there. The other thing, they're breathing it in to be able to detect things. Um, I actually had uh, taught a grad level class where I put, put forward some ideas and had the, you know, some of the students actually responded to a, a, a mock kind of funding call where I said, okay, well, how would you, how would you design a respiratory protection device for a canine that would still allow it to do its job and detect? Um, you know, I don't know if it's even possible, but it was a, it was a conversation to have because I, I do think that if, if you have people that are using a dog and they're, they're not doing any kind of decon for that animal, then yeah, it's going to be on the fur. Um, just you think about when you go to a fire and you wash your hair, uh, or, or your skin afterwards, you can smell smoke for days, whether that's a structural fire or a campfire you're at. Uh, so it absolutely will pick up the vapors, the, the particulates and things like that. So. Just to build on the health of the animal perspective, the, the dog's nasal epithelium is exposed um, and, and significantly larger compared to its body mass. Mm -hmm. And so any um, absorption through the epithelium, the nasal epithelium would be significantly greater in the dog. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's like I said, it's one of those questions that you know is is there something possible to to be able to protect them somehow, even if it's you know, maybe it's somehow blocking the particles and letting the vapors that they're going to be detecting get in or something like that. Uh, I actually reached out to our vet school and kind of tossed the question over there, and you know we were kind of just thinking back and forth: is it something that we could even look at? Because there is a significant amount of of time and resources spent training them, um, and they become part of the the departments. Um, you know, so. Um, but then, like you're saying before, like them as a vector of contaminating the vehicle or contaminating other things. Um, absolutely. So um, I don't know, are, the, are there, uh, I guess, decon methods that are prescribed or? So you, you have raised a very interesting issue and one that uh, we are doing some work on. I will guarantee you that the third edition of best practices uh, addresses that subject in, in significant detail. I mean, that's a number of people have brought that up. As, as Dr. Orman said, the dogs do their work through their respiratory system. So there's a significant challenge to protecting the animal's respiratory system and still allowing them to do their job. Uh, whether there's a method that's effective for that or not, remains to be seen, but at the very least, handlers, the human side of the, of the team, need to be deconning those animals before they go into the vehicle because that, that's the passenger compartment. It, it's no different than me taking my dirty fire and throwing it in the back seat of the truck that's then getting the nanoparticulates in the hole inside the, the animal is doing the same thing. So uh, it, it's a very good question. And it's, it's a very interesting subject that uh, we're looking to address. Do we have any other questions online, in the room? Yes, sir. And I mean, headquarters. And people come by and pat that dog. That dog could have been at a fire in the morning. And and because I, I when I see the dog at the fire when I see the dog at the fire I know the canine he brings the dog he puts him we have a special car for him no one else is in the car sure just him and the driver sure but the, it's just like putting your bunker gear in the back seat without a bag and now hey here you going with the kids if they come by the headquarters and they see the dog they all want to pat the dog but was that dog decon brought up a good point I'm gonna as soon as I get out of here I'm gonna, yeah. See, yeah, I've never really seen him wash the dog down. You know I, I will, mean? I will tell you that of the probably twenty-five or thirty different handlers that I've spoken to, um, I can definitively say that two of them, very small percentage, decon their dogs at the scene. Gross decon, yeah. I mean, no different than what we're asking for humans to do at the scene, right? And then do better cleaning when you get back to work, but. It, it's a very interesting subject. It's a very underlooked at subject that probably has much bigger ramifications than we than we can even think about. Uh, you know, they, they take the dog back to the office and the employees are pet, whatever. Yes, sir. I, I, I need you to get the microphone back so that the online people can can hear. This is a great discussion. I don't know how we're doing well, on time. And, but. and just cleaning the dog is not is not straightforward because uh, the first thing a dog does when it gets wet, it shakes. So then you've got all the aerosol. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Off. So whoever's, whoever's deconning the dog um, is, is going to have a secondary exposure just from the, the water droplets with whatever the crud Of is. course, which is no different than recommended procedures for deconning humans. The, the, the person doing the gross decon and look at the number of photos you happen to see around a different yeah, you know, the, the firefighter may have his full turnout on. The person hosing him off, getting all the nano particular off, nothing. What's wrong with that picture? Sure, it it uh, another another analogy to that. The structural firefighters, you know, they're they're in the scene for for fifteen minutes, whereas the investigators are in there for two three hours, whatever. They come out they're off gassing when they're standing around in a crowd 
and us fire investigators are interviewing, you know, they were the first in crew. What did you see? They're off gassing. We're breathing all of that in. I, I will say to you that I think 10 years from now, the fire investigation methodology is going to be grossly different than it is today. And I hope it is. Just yes, sir. As an area of adjacent research, I know there's been some studies done on forensic transfer with canines from scene to scene. So not cancer related necessarily, but evidentiary exactly. transfer. Yep. Uh, so sure it it happens. You know, I don't know specific to the chemicals, but if you needed a starting place on your research, you know, look at the forensic side of it. Exactly. There, there's a, uh, not, not to plug Netflix, but there's a very interesting Netflix show on that very subject of uh, the inaccuracies of, of canines. Very interesting. All right. Excellent discussion. Thank you, Dr. Orman. Appreciate it. Uh, it if, if any of you in the room or online are not excited by the, the research projects that we're hearing about today, then uh, I, I'd be very surprised. This is good stuff. Our la last speaker is Brian number two. Brian Gordon is a fire investigator with Palm Beach County here in Florida. He is a member of my health and safety committee, and he's going to talk about putting best practices. Oh, look, I wonder who was moving behind me on the screen. It's me. Uh, he's going to talk about putting best practices into practice in a practical way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank the people who uh, brought this all together. My department, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, uh, University of Miami, Sylvester Comprehensive Team, all their staff, the IAAI, and the uh, Florida Firefighters Health, uh, Safety and Health Collaborative. Retired Battalion Chiefs um, Sam Eaton and Vicki Shepard, who gave me the opportunity to branch off to that and have a fire investigator leg under the Firefighter Health and Safety Collaborative. More than a mouthful. So what we've done in Florida, where we're at now in Florida, is we have approximately 25 fire investigators who have signed up uh, for a cohort study. So we're trying to show the awareness. We already have the foundation that you've seen today. You have the IAAI with the white papers. So if there's no protocol in place, there's your start. Um, start getting involved in your departments. You have the documentation from the physicians that are doing the studies on what the investigators are taking, what they're wearing. Take all that information, make a proposal, and make change. I always was taught that you just can't go in there and say, hey, we need this change. But if you provide documentation, this is a good way to start. So now where are we at trying to mitigate all of this stuff that's being um, researched? So we're taking a clean cab concept also. Um, right now we all have uh, king cab F-150s. We don't have any gear inside of our passenger compartment. Everything is in the rear. Um, our PPEs, our respiratory PPE are in um, plastic bins that are closed, our evidence cans that are closed, uh, our gear. Once we wear our gear, you know, we utilize what's, you know, it's in the white paper, we bag it and we send it off. We're lucky. You're going to have to find other alternatives if your department doesn't have a second set of gear or a, a, a transfer. Um, we have other PPE respiratory protection that's available to us. We have SCBA, we have PAPR, we have our half mask, of course, um, and a couple other um, hazmat canisters that we utilize. Um, currently, we're working on research for a 12 volt, 11 gallon um, decontamination water pump. So we can decontaminate something um, that's on scene that's necessary. Um, our Tyvek suits, our Tyvek sleeves, our onesies, these are all ensembles that we use um, to perform, you know, the investigations. And during the research, we're going to collect all the data and hopefully in another two years, maybe Florida will be, um, will show the results from the Florida fire investigators. We do have one more um, investigator collaborative meeting 
for the investigator cohort study. So that's coming. And um, that's where we're at in real time, trying to put everything together and, uh, and working with it. So I was gonna make it. <clears throat> where do things stand on the model policy that I know you guys have been working on? Lucky for me, we have our uh, department face team. So they really, you know, paved the way. It's an easy sell. So the departments in Florida, if you're online, um, Florida departments are now going towards all the recommendations from the Firefighter Health and Safety Collaborative, get their um, protocol, your SOGs, and as a, an investigator or an inspector that's responsible for origin and cause, this is all for you. Use those tools to create your own policy and to mimic for the, you know, for whatever they're using so you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Any questions inside the room? All right, great. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. This, uh, we may be a few minutes early, but we have said everything we need to say. The room is a little warmer than I personally like, which means some of my compadres are quite comfortable, whatever. <laughs> but um, I appreciate everyone coming, uh, both in person and online. I uh, look forward to hearing what the numbers are. Uh, we are a small group. You know, fire investigators are just a small, small portion of the fire service. But as we have said, at fire, more fire scenes than the firefighters, there for longer, less well protected. And those are the challenges that we need to deal with. And those are also the things that set us apart from the rest of the fire service. Looking forward to all this research. I'm looking forward to some projects that are in the pipeline that it's too early to talk about, but there's gonna be more and uh, it's, it's long overdue. I'm really glad that it's coming to. Thank you all for your attendance, I appreciate it.